Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, afternoon. Welcome to the Entrepreneurship Forum. Today we have a special guest. We have several special guests, actually, including the dean of the school. And um, we have uh, uh, today a special guest, Bill Child, the founder and president of R.C. Willie. And on Berkshire Hathaway's board, and, and uh, Don Skousen is going to introduce you. It's my priv privilege to introduce Bill Child, a longtime friend. But Bill is the chairman of R.C. Willie. He grew up in northern Utah. He graduated from the University of Utah and was going to be a a teacher. He had his teaching contract ready to go, but didn't sign it. Family events occurred, and the rest is history. Bill is the real deal. He's a man of firm faith and conviction, possesses a very competitive drive, and the will to defy conventional wisdom to help him succeed. It has been described that the approach bi taken by Bill to promote business relationship is one based on, quote, seamless web of deserved trust, close quote. Hmm. These are some of the personal traits that convinced Warren Buffett to go into business with Bill and to build a lasting friendship. Bill brings to us a rich entrepreneurial spirit from the very beginnings of R.C. Willie to his current project at Poipu Beach in Kauai, Kaloa Landing. In general, he reflects the ability of humanity to accomplish great things. Please join with me in welcoming Bill Child. Bill? Well, thank you, Don. That's a, a, for those very complimentary words. My gosh, I should have him speak at my funeral. <laughs> I mean, that would be a real, uh, a real treat. <clears throat> or I should have you come and talk when my wife's here, so she would uh, appreciate. Yeah, we got to bring her next time. <laughs> yes. Well, it's a privilege to be here. I, I congratulate you on furthering your education. You know, Warren Buffett gets asked at times. What can I do right now? I want to be successful, and what can I do? What's the best use of my time? Uh, I want to get in business. I've passed this deal up, and I should have gotten here and there. And What do you think I should do? And uh, he says, well, I think the most important thing you can do today is invest in yourself. Get your education. There will always be opportunities. So you invest in yourself, and you'll be prepared. When the opportunities come, you'll be prepared to take advantage of them. And I think that's true. There are always opportunities. <clears throat> I took this little business over in 1954, and there were a lot of opportunities there. There were a lot of opportunities considerably earlier. My father-in-law started in 1932. That was during the Depression. But there were a tremendous amount of opportunities, as I'll tell you as we go on a little bit. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my business experiences. It's, it's rather difficult to put 30 years into 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes. So I'm going to hit the high spots. We'll uh, get you something to think about, and maybe you can come up with some creative ideas. You always have to get out of the box. It's, it's crucial and very important to, to think out of the box a little bit. One dumb thing, I was in North Carolina, I bought a condominium when I sold the business to Warren, I had a little money, and we go back there twice a year to the furniture market. And I have this condominium, <clears throat> and uh, it was just a pleasure, because we used to have to stay with people, or hard to get rentals there at that time, and it's a small little uh, community, North Car uh, High Point, North Carolina, it's grown now, but when we started it was very small. But anyway, I had a shower that uh, was leaking. And so I hired a guy, or I had my handy guy who goes back with us. He's one of our buyers. But we had room for all the guys in this nice condominium. But the darn shower leaked. 
and uh, he went back and he so he put some some uh, stick them on them whatever I don't know silicon or something and so he said I got it all fixed next time he went back next year it still leaked so anyway I hired a somebody else to come in and and he worked on it and changed the the uh, glass the glass sliding glasses and uh, he said I've got it all fixed he charged me and so forth next year or next I go in twice a year still leaking and I thought, well, what in the world? There's got to be a different solution, an easy solution to that thing. Uh, I mean, it's nice. I don't use the tub. It's nice to have a shower. But I don't want one that leaks. So what, what do you think the solution would be? It's so simple. Shower curtain. Shower curtain. Yeah, I put up a shower curtain. And I went down and bought a shower curtain put up. It's never leaked since. This was oh, 10 years ago that I put the shower curtain up. And I thought, it wasn't that dumb not to have done that before. Now, take the shower curtain out. It's prob still probably going to leak. And I don't know why. I can't figure it out because it's a pretty good petition. So you need to get out of the box sometimes. And sometimes you just don't think about some of the simplest things. Well, anyway, <clears throat> most of my talk will be concerned concerning R.C. Willie, and I'll try to hit a few high points here so that we can get into it. Uh, let me just show you, see if we can... The other one, Bill. That one? The, the bottom arrow. Oh, the bottom goes down. Okay. Uh, now I'm just going to show you. 1954, this is the little store that I took over. 600 square feet had the electrical power run from the house to the store, nine-party telephone line, no bathroom facilities, uh, cement floor, cinder block walls inside. There's one more, and there's uh, R.C. Willie. That's Rufus Call Willie. He started the business. And, uh, but then I want to show you one other one here. Sixty years later, this is what's happened. That was about 40 years later. That's our Murray store. Oops. And that's uh, our corporate building today. This is Warren Buffett, the second from the your left. And uh, my brother and my son. And uh, Richard Turbo was our chief financial officer. Richard was an interesting guy, wonderful guy. He's still he's on a mission now, a church mission. But anyway, when I interviewed him, I said, well, Richard, tell me a little about yourself. He said, well, I'm a student body president. I finished fourth in the class. Or no, second in the class, second in the class. And uh, in my high school class, and I said, well, that's not too bad. How many did you have in your class? Well, there was six, he said. <laughs> it was in Tabioca, Tabiona, Utah. I said, well, how did you get elected president? Soon my president, he said, well, the guy that was running for president was uh, dating my cousin, and he uh, went out with some other gal, and so all my turnbows were upset at him, and they carried all the votes, so they voted me, and I wasn't even running. And that's how he <laughs> becomes body president. So, but he did a good job. He was really a, a good guy. And uh, that was the Boise store many years ago. Uh, this is Warren Buffett, and this is Louis Blumkin, a great friend of mine and our, one of our managers. This, guy, this little boy sang the, uh, the uh, Star Spangled Banner at the, uh, at the opening of, of one of our stores. I can't remember exactly which one it was. Anyway, let me just show you real quickly. Uh, this is the new store that we're opening down uh, in Draper, right next to the uh, IKEA, and you've got to go see it. It's it's a it's it's really a fanta fantastic store. These are a couple of the inside shots. There's a few cars we just barely opened. Anyway, let's go back. This was Las Vegas, of course. <laughs> okay, from here, 60 years later, look what's happened. When I took over the business in 1954, there were probably 40, I think 44, or 45 
different uh, appliance and electronic and furniture companies. And they were all bigger than we were, all better financed, I'm sure, because they were all operating. We were in the red a little bit, quite a little bit. And they were all there, but there's only two left today, and none of them have grown. None of them, none of them have expanded. So uh, the question is why? Why did we come from here doing 100 and last best year my father-in-law had was 157,000. When I retired, we're doing 800 million, and we're shooting now for a billion in a couple of years. We had 3,000 employees, and all those stores have gone except Sterling Furniture and a little company called Kiesel Sales and Service. I was in High Point, the furniture mart, by the way, and my shower didn't leak. And uh, there was an article in Furniture Today, and it talked about a company called Harkness Furniture Company. And when I just barely started into the furniture business, when I converted this into uh, not only appliance, but I added 10,000 square feet in the furniture, uh, I went and visited that Harkness Furniture Company, and I thought that was one of the finest furniture companies I'd ever seen. I mean, it was so well run, the warehouse was clean and, and, and uh, orderly, and it just looked like a million dollars. And I thought, wow, I would like to build a store. I'd like our store to be like that. Well, 60 years later, <coughs> they're still in business, and they won an award for being the most outstanding furniture store in the in a volume range of under ten million dollars meaning that they're doing less than ten million dollars today and here we're doing close to eight hundred million so wh what happened why is that what's the difference why would uh, obviously Warren Buffett would not buy Harkness furniture but he bought our company there's got to be a lot of these reasons why. And uh, that's maybe part of the thing I'm going to talk to you about. Had a book written, uh, and uh, it says, How to Build a Business Warren Buffett Would Buy. And uh, the guy that wrote it, uh, I said, Well, why do you want to write this book? And he said, Well, you took the business over in 1954. It was actually bankrupt assets were considerably less than liabilities, not two to one, maybe like one to ten, ten more <laughs> liabilities than assets. And uh, 40 years later, you sell it to the second richest man in the world. Now there's got to be a little bit in between. And that's what I want to write about. So this is what he wrote in the book. I wished I had a few. I was going to give some away. In, but. Uh, I have one. I have a little project in Hawaii, and I've written some things in there. This is the only one I could find around the house. So anyway, that's what I'd like to talk to you about a little bit. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> R.C. Willie started, uh, Rufus Call Willie, started selling door-to-door -door in 1932. Now, if you take 1932, and uh, that was during the recession. But the, uh, he worked for the power company, and they had just recently electrified or put electricity in Weber and Davis County, meaning that they had light bulbs, but they didn't have any appliances. And so he got the idea that maybe he could pick up these appliances and sell them to the farmers. Well, the farmer said, no, I don't need a refrigerator. I, don't, I can't afford it and so forth. But he would take it and said, I want, you, I want to put this in and let you use it for a week. And if you don't like it, I'll come and take it out. It won't cost you anything. So he'd put them in. And well, do you think he was going to get it out? No way. Nobody ever. He never took one back. And the farmer says, well, how do I pay for it now? And he said, well, I've got a farm plan. I've, I've got a, a system. And he had arranged with the local banker to, to put it on what they call the farm plan, which the farmer could pay one-third when he got his harvest in, or his checks for his harvest, one-third next year, and one-third the following year. So they're usually a three-year contract. And that the farmer could make, and of course he kept his wife happy. And uh, he, R.C. was very successful in doing this. 
And he did this for 18 years, all by himself. He delivered, he went out in the, to the customer's homes, he'd go down and buy a refrigerator and buy electric cranes, he'd go out in the customer's home and put it in on the same program. You just try it, you don't have to sign anything. And uh, never checked anyone's credit. Of course, everyone was paid pretty well in those days. They don't today, but they did then. You have to be a little bit careful today on credit. But he was, he was you know, he made a good living. And then in 1950, 1949, <coughs> he was forced to build the building. And why would you build it in Syracuse? Uh, the distributor said, look, we can't sell you if, you're gonna, uh, if you don't have a building. I mean, the dealers are complaining that you're underselling us, them. They couldn't compete. He had no overhead. They had uh, an overhead, and they kept saying, look, he's, he's not really a legitimate dealer. He doesn't have a store of any kind. So he was confronted with the fact that he had to either rent a store or lease a store or build a store. And normally, you would have built it uptown. In Syracuse in 1954, 49, uh, there was about maybe four or 500 people. You had a local grocery store and a blacksmith shop. And we had one guy that knew a little bit about cars. He was kind of a mechanic. And one other small. You had three little small businesses in Syracuse. And so he decided, he and the, his rep said, well, why don't we just, we want to comply. Why don't we just build a little store right next to the house, right in the corn patch here. So that's what they did. And that's what it was, uh, 600 square feet had the sign on top, and we were selling some appliances and television. The uh, little antenna was to bring in the signal for, for the uh, television. And, but he was legitimate then. He, uh, he met all the criteria. He had a store, and he didn't think that anyone was going to come out to that store, because he'd always gone out, but he found that people kind of liked to come and get a, a selection of, of different, maybe four or five different refrigerators and four or five different ranges and he had water heaters and electric washers were, hadn't come in yet but they were just starting to come in. Uh, automatic washers I should say, the electric washers were always there. But he sold a lot of the old twin tub Dexters and uh, washing machines and of course a square tub Maytag sold a few of those. But anyway, there he was, <clears throat> a legitimate dealer, and he, at that time he had to have a man, he had to hire someone to make the deliveries. If people were going to come out and he was going to sell them, someone had to deliver it. So he hired an employee, that was the only employee he had. So in 1954, uh, he gave me the keys to his store and said, look, I'm going to California to take care of an ulcer. I'll be back in three or four weeks but I want you to take care of the store. And I had helped him a little bit. I had done quite a bit there because uh, I was married to his daughter for three years there while I was going to school and we'd come home on weekends and it was more fun to help him in the appliance business than it was my dad on the farm. And my brother was getting old enough that he could do that farm work and, and, and I, it was more fun to be able to talk to people and to help delivery and so forth. So anyway, uh, there we were. Uh, he gave me these keys and said, I'll be right back, maybe three or four weeks. And he came back in about four days, <clears throat> went right in the house, uh, never came back in the store. He was deathly ill, went right in the hospital after that and passed away of cancer of the pancreas. So there I was, 22 years old, having the responsibility of the business. And I thought all businesses had money, but I learned very quickly that uh, that was not the case with R.C. Willie. He, uh, he had operated uh, a one-man operation. His cash register was his wallet in his pocket. He had a bookkeeper that was not exactly uh, helpful or honest. And uh, so it was a rather dismal situation. So I had a little, uh, he did have one, a good reputation for saving money. So I had a little, uh, about with the banker, not about, but I was able to communicate with him. I started paying a few bills and 
he said, uh, called me and he said, Bill, you can't pay bills. He said, Bill, what are you doing? You're paying bills, you don't have any money on the account. And I said, well, uh, I know that, but I've looked at the last three or four bank statements and they're all in the red, and I just assumed that you were accumulating those. You know, I knew there wasn't, you know, I was becoming to, to realize that, hey, I thought R.C. Willie had some money here, enough to run the business, but we're in trouble. We just don't have it. So anyway, I, uh, well, he wanted to come and uh, me to come over and talk with him. So I, my mother-in-law and I went over and he said, you got to let this boy go teach school. And you got to sell this business and so forth. And so on the way home, I said, you know, I have to tell you what I know. Uh, my mother-in-law's name was Helen. I said, we don't have anything to sell. We've got a 600 square foot building that was run by a one-man operation and it's very difficult for anyone to want to take that over and what would they give you for it? And in addition to that, there's a lot of baggage. We own, we own $9,000 on a new warehouse that we built. We never made a payment on it. We got all these contracts that we have signed full recourse on. They're on the farm and a lot of them are delinquent. They want us to pay those back and we got about a $6,000 overdraft in the bank. I said, you know, I'd love to walk away. It would be great, but we can't do that. So I had a little discussion with the banker and told him, I said, you can close us, but you wouldn't get anything. There's nothing. I mean, it's not that we don't want to pay. It's just we don't have it. Oh, my word. Oh, my word. The banker that my father-in-law dealt with had gone to Europe. He was an old gentleman, a wonderful guy. He owned the bank. His family owned the bank, and he was on. He was in Europe, and so the new president to be was the guy that I had to negotiate with. So I think the fact that maybe I had graduated from college uh, gave me some confidence to be able to address this with the banker and stand toe to toe and say, "Look, here's the situation. I mean, you don't have much of a choice." Uh, I mean, it's your choice, but I, you, if you make the right one, we'll try to get this business profitable, and I'm sure we've got a good reputation, and I'm sure eventually we can bring it around to where we can pay off all our obligations, which we did, and of course, took a two or three couple of tough years and, and rough years, but we finally did, and I learned a real lesson. Number one, I never wanted to be beholden to a, an obligation to a bank or someone that I owed money to. So I never have had a mortgage on a building. If I couldn't build a building and pay for it, I didn't build it. When I finally got to that point, I decided that I didn't ever want to be that. And, and I'm not sure that's a great thing. We have a little project down here at the River Park. Uh, and we have loans on most of our buildings, but never more than about 55% of the value of the building, which I have my other partners that are good partners and good guys and they like to lo they like to borrow I would rather just pay them all off and not you know build as we could but the park is pretty much full now and it's cash flowing it's, it's one of those good investments that come along once in a while too so anyway uh, that was a kind of a rough start then you know you wonder why he would build a store in Syracuse and that's why I mean it was just to comply and there it was and uh, Let's see if I hit the next one, I'm going to get RC. That was his lineup, and he was very proud of the store, and it worked out very well. Uh, had he thought out of the box, I think he would have had 10 people doing the same thing he was doing when he was selling door to door. He could have had and just managed that because there was a need. If you don't have a refrigerator and someone puts one in for you, wow, how can you go wrong? How can you let it out? It became either the refrigerator or the wife, you know. So you, you definitely have to, it's not a hard choice to make, you know. Yeah, we'll take the refrigerator, we want to keep the refrigerator, or electric range. So there was no air conditioning in those days. And 90% and of the populace was farmers. And it was hard work. And in the summertime, very hard and sweaty. And, and when you had to cook a, a meal, and the only way you could actually cook it was with the fire of a coal stove or a wood stove. And that just added more to the temperature of the house. So if you could turn on a switch and get a heat immediately with an electric range, it was, it was, it was just a miracle. Uh, 
So those are things that, to us, that have all the conveniences in the world, it's hard for us to understand and realize, but uh, those were definite needs. So what an opportunity it was for him, instead of doing it himself, hire more and you know, and manage it. But uh, there again, he didn't get out of the box and he knew what he was doing and so forth. So anyway, let me just move along a little bit. Uh, I decided uh, with a number of appliance problems that we had at that time, they were just putting in automatic washers, they were just coming in and we sold a lot of them. I mean, it was, uh, it was a hot seller. But there was, they were flawed. They had some mechanical problems and, and we felt like we had to take care of them and sometimes the manufacturers wouldn't stand behind us. Uh, Hot Point, for example, I remember selling 400 of their automatic washer that uh, had a new, what they called, uh, centrifugal clutch. They'd had the old fluid drive and the old, and that's the thing that spins the tub and kind of dries it so you can at least take it out of out of there without being, you know, rigging wet. The old uh, manual washers, you might say, uh, Dexter and, and uh, Maytag had a rigger that you run them through, but this was a spinner. But anyway, this fluid uh, drive, after about nine months of average use, it kind of wore out and it would spin slow enough so that you could never get the water out. And so we had to replace all those. The manufacturers weren't very excited about helping us. In fact, they didn't really. So we went almost a year. It was just getting on top and almost a year without hardly any profit just because we felt like we were obligated to fix those washers and take care of them. And I later learned that the same, that very shortly, the same parts, of the parts they put in the first place were the ones they were replacing them with. And so that was a real problem, and one of the manufacturing problems. Things have gotten a lot better now and a lot more accountability, but uh, I mean, I could not understand that. I just said, how in the world can you do this? And of course, we dropped that line of washers for some time. And, but anyway, one of the problems, so I decided to get into the furniture. And when I got into the furniture business, guess what? I, oh, I'd, I'd made a little money on a, on a real estate deal that I'd gotten into with my uh, sister's husband. And uh, I, in fact, I'd cleared $10,000 and I thought, I can build and I can go in the furniture business. I had started selling a little furniture out of my garage, which was 100 yards down the way to the customers. So anyway, I expanded. I added 10,000 square feet, which is not very much normally, but it's, it was a lot more than 600 square feet. And uh, well, let's see. No, wait a minute. The first expansion was 1,600. I'm sorry, 1,600 square feet. So I had a number of sofas and a few couple, two or three bedroom sets. And lo and behold, the volume doubled. Same customers selling more product to them, which made a lot of sense to me. Uh, you know, these same customers were there and they were coming out and if you can sell them more product and uh, you could only sell them maybe one refrigerator every 10 or 15 years but, and maybe only one bedroom set, but uh, at least you've got more product to sell. So that was, a good, that was a good decision to do that. We expanded the Syracuse store many, 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 many uh, times. Finally decided that, uh, well, most of our business is coming from Hill Air Force Base. And it was really a, a very heavy uh, employer of people. We had 3,000 military people there, and we also had uh, about 21,000 workers. And so, and we were getting about, of the military, we were getting almost 90% of the sales. And it was wonderful because these people would leave, spend their three years there, and then they'd come back in another three years. and buy more from us and so forth. So it was doing very well, but they kept, the government kept saying, well, we're gonna close or shut down or not close, but at least downscale Hill Air Force Base. So we thought, well, we need to diversify. When we looked at the uh, demographics of Utah, 25% at that time of the business was done in Davis County North. 50% was done in the Salt Lake Valley. And 25% of the business retail business was done south, south of Salt Lake, down in the Provo, Orem, uh, St. George area. And uh, so we needed to be in that 50% uh, 
that Salt Lake area. So it was a little bit of a challenge to move into Salt Lake, but we did and uh, opened a store in Murray and it did extremely well. Then another thing that we did uh, that uh, normally television was just coming in and it was getting a little bit stronger. And uh, we did a few television ads, and, uh, and they were they were very good. You only had three stations at that time, but uh, I noticed that there was a lot of the time that uh, they weren't selling the spot on television, and they were running like KSL was running a spot for KSL or a spot for one of their programs, and so forth. So the the uh, gentleman that uh, run the uh, our, our sales rep came out, and I said, well, "Look, what." What do you do when you can't sell that spot? I mean, it's uh, it's perishable. It's gone. Uh, if you don't sell it right at that hour, you'll never have it again. What do you do? You go, oh well, we run just these fill-in, plug-in spots, so forth. And I said, well, you know, these spots is pretty low or pretty low for t today, but they run anywhere from probably a hundred dollars up to fifteen hundred dollars. And I said, well, look. If you would plug us in and you'll sell me all those spots that you can't sell that run anywhere from, say, $250 up to $1,500, I'll pay you $50 a spot for them. He said, oh, wow. Well. He says, I don't know I can get that through the management. He went to them and they said, okay. And so here we were buying spots for $50 that were normally $600 or normally $800. And all my competitors, are, everybody would say, well, how in the world are you, why are you spending so much money on television? And I said, well, it's a good media, and I think it's just, you know. <laughs> and I think and it, it makes a lot, but when we moved into the Salt Lake market, there we were already with, with a, a reputation, and our TV spots were covering it. We were only, instead of only getting maybe 25% of the market, we were getting 75% and a little bit more. So that was a good move. Uh, credit seemed to be a very important thing. If you're going to sell appliances and uh, furniture, high, oh dear, let me just check. I hope I'm doing okay. Not quite. If you're going to sell these products, you have to provide financing for them. And uh, so we uh, had gone from one company. The banks didn't want to carry them, but the finance companies would. Mr. L. Patterson, there was uh, Western, whatever it was, and uh, Commercial Credit, oh, half a dozen other companies that we could, you know, you had to be able to place your paper because we weren't in a position to carry it at that time. So we went ahead and uh, placed a lot of paper. Once we put so much with the company, then they couldn't, didn't want to buy any more, and so it was always a problem. And I thought, well, we need to carry our own accounts. And I had gone to a seminar. And I talked to a guy after the seminar, and I said, well, you're carrying your own accounts. Now, why are you doing it, number one? He said, well, there's a law that says, the ins it's called the installment basis reporting income, meaning that if you can build a portfolio of funds, you don't have to pay income tax on it until you sell it. I said, oh, that's great. In other words, if I have a million dollars on the books, uh, normally I would be paying probably 35% that's uh, 350000 in taxes, I wouldn't have to pay it as long as it stays on the books. He said, that's right. I said, oh, that's great. That's terrific. So I went in and decided we're going we're gonna to go ahead and, and carry our own accounts. And so we went big. We uh, uh, tied in with a, uh, a major bank. We pledged the security of the accounts to, in order to borrow money. And uh, when we got... When the law was closed, we had about almost seven million on the books that we had paid no income tax on, which gave us money to expand. That was the reason and the way that we were able to expand. We, had, we were the only ones that were doing that. There was also one more caveat in that too. When Mr. Carter was president, President Carter, the prime rate went to 21 percent on money, so everyone was borrowing. I mean, most people were borrowing at 22, 23 percent. We were loaning it out at 18. Now, it doesn't make a lot of sense loan it out at 18 when you're paying 20, 22 and 23 percent. We'd knocked it down. I think we were paying 22 percent for money, but we were still loaning it out at 18. Uh, 
you're losing three to four percent on everything you finance. But we were the only furniture company that was able to finance, uh, that, that was able to provide credit for these customers. We were competing with Granite Furniture and a half a dozen others, and our sales went like this. Their sales were going like this because if a, a person didn't come in with cash, there was no way they could finance them. They didn't carry their own accounts, and the finance companies wouldn't take the paper. And here we were taking our, you know, we were just having a heyday. Sales were really moving, and that's when we went from, you know, from here right on up. We had three, two and two and a half to three of the best years we've ever had, simply because we were losing money on the financing, but we were certainly making up on the, on the volume, number one, and also we weren't discounting our product, but we were able to sell and carry our own accounts, and these were great, great accounts. That's what got us really into the finance business, finance business, and that was one of the things that Warren Buffett liked about our company. It differentiated us from, we had a couple hundred million on the books when he looked at us, and, and it was making more money than we were making out of the furniture sales. And he said, oh wow, you got a double whammy here. This is really a great, concern, great company. Because we were as larger and larger than some of the banks around town. So uh, that was one of the things that, that I think was quite important, credit. Now, let me do this. Uh, one other thing that gave us a, a little bit of a shot was we built an infrastructure that our competitors didn't. In other words, you have to have a way to service. You have to have a back end. You ought to be able to service your consumer. You make that sale, you've got to have a, a way of delivering it and servicing it and providing the inventory so that you can sell. And we built the big 200,000 square foot warehouse right almost at the point of a uh, 2000 when we had a little bit of a recession there and everybody was pulling their horns in and uh, Granite Furniture was our big competitor and they were adding, they added a couple of stores but they added no infrastructure. Our business went like this, theirs went like that because they couldn't service, they couldn't take care of the customer. Their service was not that they wanted it to be but it wasn't really very good because they just didn't have the capacity to handle it. So we made a good commitment there, and that worked out well. Uh, the, uh, another couple of points. Uh, <clears throat> oh, let me just get into 1995. 1995, uh, we had grown to around 260 million in sales, had 1,500 employees, and we had had five offers to buy our business. Two of them were retailers. One of them was a company called Halig Myers, which is a good company. One of them was a company called Montgomery Wards, which I didn't think was a very good company. But I didn't like the management at Halig Myers. I liked the, the original management, but I didn't really like them, so I kind of crossed them out. Then we had three investment companies that had made us offers for our company. And then I got a hold of a, I was at a meeting, and I'm just going to show you. Here we go. This is, we had all this, we had built this. But anyway, here we are. That's when I uh, met this uh, gentleman. I showed you his picture a little while, uh, Irv Blumpkin. He had bought their, uh, Warren Buffett had bought their furniture company in Omaha and uh, paid him $60 million for it. If they'd have taken stock instead of $60 million in cash, it would have been worth considerably more than a billion today. But Mrs. B, the owner of the store didn't like paper. She thought she thought these certificates weren't worth much. She wanted cash. She knew what that was. She was a wonderful lady, a, a Russian immigrant, a Jewish immigrant that came over here uh, with a tag around her her neck with her name on it. She couldn't speak a word of English, but she built a fabulous furniture store in uh, Omaha. And Warren, of course, wanted to buy it, and he did buy it and, and paid him cash for it. But anyway, I asked Irv if Warren might have an interest in our company. So I thought, you know, I'm getting a little older. I was 62 at the time, and my brother was not going to be able to take the company over. He was uh, had some church assignments and so forth. And so I thought, you know, I want this business to continue long before or beyond my uh, demise. And so maybe it might be a good idea to, to go ahead and sell it, if the deal's right. I turned all the other five down, even though 
some of them were pretty lucrative. But I, number one, had I gone with Haley Myers, I'd lost it all because they went bankrupt about four years later, and uh, and and so was uh, the other retailer. And the uh, one thing about it, we wanted to stay closed on Sunday, and uh, the. Uh, investment banking company that I looked at, when I showed him that uh, the business or this store, we went out to the Murray store and he said, you know, this store will, would perform well in any place in America. He said, this is going to be a great store. And I said, now look, we're closed on Sundays. Oh, don't worry about that. We'll talk about that later and so forth. And I said, uh-oh, this, this guy's not going to... Once you sell the business, it's theirs. It's not yours and you don't make the decisions anymore. But with Warren, you do. Warren is, is such a great gentleman. But anyway, uh, it was rather interesting. Uh, this friend of mine says, well, I'll talk to him. And so he chatted with him for a, a little while. I guess he went to lunch and he said, uh, this, you know, Bill has an interest in selling his company. And so Warren called me and he said, uh, or Irv called me back and he said, Warren's going to call you. He's very interested in your company. So he calls me back and, and uh, I said, uh, Warren, he said, well, Bill, I understand you have an interest in selling your company. I said, yeah, I, I've, I've been thinking about it. I've got a few offers, but I'm not very happy with any of them. And uh, I said, well, you want to, should we chat about it for a few minutes? And he said, I, I can take all the time in the world. And so we chatted, and I got very comfortable with him. I said, well, what would you like me to do afterwards? And he said, well, send me about three years financials, and I'll get back with you. So I sent him three years financials and about all three or four days, here comes a FedEx that says you have a jewel of your company. Jewel of a company, it fits our mold perfectly, I'll have you a price in three days. Well, in three days, here comes that FedEx, you know. And uh, I opened it up, my office all by myself, and looked at it, and wow, it was about 30,000 or 25,000 less than we'd been offered. But it was still an awful lot of money. It was 100, I think it was $170 million. That's a lot of money for a kid that was raised on a farm. And I thought, you know, this is really interesting. So anyway, I called him and I said, you've got to come out and take a look at it. Complimented him and so forth. And so uh, we finally talked him into coming out. It's been a nice day with him. And I thought, you know, this is going to be really good. So we debated for a little while. And I told him, I said, look, you got my vote. Of course, I had the majority of the votes, too. And, but I said, we've got to have it tax-free, because it's less than what had been offered quite a little bit. But I said, it's, it, it really kind of fits us, because we sell it to you, we keep running it. It's seamless, there's no problems with uh, someone coming along and selling it. We're going to stay closed on Sunday. Uh, we're still running our own company. Everybody we can, in the company is going to benefit. It's not going to be any kind of a negative aspect. The community will be better. I'll be happier. I'll continue. He said, I insisted, or he insisted I continue to run it for another seven years. And I told him I'd, I would do that. He wanted me for longer than that. And I said, oh, you know. I thought I would be able to turn it over at that time, and so and that's what I did. And we went from 260 million up to 800 million in those seven years. So we did very, very well. And we also got out of state, which was very important to us. So let me just show you a couple more pictures if I can, and and then we'll ask some questions. These are some of the uh, the facts on the company. It's, it is really the American dream. Oops, that doesn't go any farther, does it? Oops. Oh, there it is. We're going the wrong way. Here we go. That was the, the property I bought for the uh, Boise store. That's, uh, that was an interesting story, how we got out of state. He didn't want to go out of state. I finally had to make him a deal that he couldn't turn down. I said, I will buy the property personally. I'll build the store. If we're not successful, we'll close it. He said, OK. And so there we did. And, and it did turn out to be very successful. Uh, he said, if we can't do 30 million, We'll close it. I said, okay. We did 50 million the first year. And this is our new store, which you've got to go see. Okay, these are some of the rules we tried to live by. They're in the book. You can, business principles learned. You know. Here, oh, when I got the book signed, you know, Warren, he, he, for charity, he, he, he'll agree to have lunch with uh, four people. And they usually pay between two to two and a half million dollars. 
I had lunch with him and it cost me $28. I had to buy the lunch when I had the book signed. Good friend, we've had him in our own home. That's the copy of the book. Uh, these are some of the philosophies I could talk about. Uh, better than your competitors, value, be treated. Uh, they're also in the book. Should have spent a few minutes on those. Uh, everybody asked me, what did you do since then? Well, we built the orthopedic building. I got, uh, when I retired, I got a little anxious. So we went into uh, uh, a, real, a couple of real estate deals. River Park, 106 South, owned, uh, built the first building on that one. And then uh, that's a, a, been a very successful one. Okay, and Kaloa Landing, this is the one that uh, timing wasn't very good on. There's the piece of property on the island of Kauai, but it actually has turned out quite well. I mean, it's, it's gonna be good. This is it now. It's a beautiful resort. And thank heavens I had no debt and was able to step up and, and do the financing. This has a putting green around it now. So if anybody if you ever want to go to Kauai, let me know. Okay, well I guess we're ready. We got one minute for questions. Oh my gosh, yes. Um, what's the first piece of advice you'd give somebody who wants to open their business? She's first, asking, what is the first piece of advice you would give to someone who wants to open up their own business? Okay. Uh, obviously, you need a lot of information. You need to know your market, you need to know your competition, uh, you need to know what the future is. Uh, times have changed. I mean, we live in a world of change. And uh, I could tell you so many companies that you could invest in 10 years ago that looked great, but they're out of business now. And they're not out of business because they were bad businesses, they're out of business because the world's changed. So I would say the right kind of a business with a future, try to look into the future, what it is, be able to have enough capital too. Capital is very important and you never want to borrow more than you can cover. The banks loan you money if you don't need it. But when you really need it and you're desperate, it's very hard to get money from the banks or from anyone else, a loaning institution. So it, 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 it depends on the type of business, but there are lots of opportunities. But I would say you can make good decisions if you have enough knowledge, enough information. Okay. Another one? Back here. I had a question. I noticed you said that you're uh, building another RC Willie right next to the IKEA. Uh huh. Um, What's the strategy in that? I mean, are you trying to persuade their customers? Well, Obviously. I have to admit that I did not pick the site. I was afraid that uh, I like to be out alone, you know, like our other stores are. But uh, we've been open about a, about a, well, not a week, about four or five days. We're seeing a ton of <coughs> IKEA people come over and we're selling them. And so I think maybe the philosophy is, is pretty good. But you have to be better in your competition. You have to offer something different. You have to differentiate. And I think we are, go down and take a look. Walk in Kia, go through it, and then come to ours. So Kia is a little lower end. I mean, it's disposable type furniture, I call. But then you, <laughs> or maybe entry level cut. But then come over and walk through our stores. Uh, are you guys still doing hot dogs on Saturday? Uh, that was, now my <laughs> nephews are running the business now. I used they to do it. I used to do it. weekend. Yeah, we, do, we don't do it like, they don't think it's, they don't think it's classy enough. I thought it was a great idea. And, and we always did a couple hundred thousand dollars more every weekend we did it. So I like I that. It. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <Well>, yes. <clears throat> Are you yes. still closed oh, on Sundays? Yes, oh, definitely, in every state, all, always, yeah. We don't think you have to work on Sunday. Not that it's, uh, uh, I mean, we just think the associate needs to be able to spend time with his family, and if you're open six days a week, nine hours a day, that's quite a bit. So you should be able to make it. If you can't, you need to maybe get into a different business or something. I have one quick question. On your 
your list of uh, advice and things that you had in your PowerPoint. Since the students didn't have uh, much, I know that we wanted to write them down. Oh, I'm sorry. Can we get copies of that? Or it's in his book. I have made one going to, for oh, my okay. students in other classes. John, I have another book here that uh, it's one I, I, I have in our book uh, gift shop over at Hawaii. And I send them over. They go real fast. I mean, one lady bought one one year and come back and bought five the next year. One dollar kids to, to have the book. She thought it had some uh, uh, different. So I wrote in here, and I should have just tore, tore this page out. It's the only one I have. But Don's going to give it to somebody or keep it. I'm sorry I didn't get time. I should have gone. My plan was to go through this. So. Well, I hope you took good notes. <laughs> this was really a case study yes, it's of a case study. starting your own business <coughs> and growing it <coughs> and selling it and have an exit strategy, retiring, and he's probably busier now after he's retired. So, oh, Bill, yes. let's give Bill a, a <laughs> round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. One he truly is a friend of the college. Well, one quick bit of advice. If you ever have anything to do with Warren Buffett, do it. He's the greatest individual, greatest partner in the world. His word is his bond. He's bright. I usually tell the students that my business IQ went up 15 points after I spent 15 years with him. Because he is very, very brilliant. And uh, he simplifies things. He'll say something, and you look at it, and you say, what does he really mean? And then you think about it, and it makes so much sense. It's so so clear, so much clarity in what he says. He's uh, he, he is really a a, a genius, and uh, there's just nobody any better. I I can tell you that. And he's no no one with more integrity. And he doesn't buy companies that don't have integrity, that don't have a future. He doesn't want somebody that's had a terrible past but a great future because normally the future is like the past and so he's very cautious on what he buys but there's nobody that can deploy money like he can and he has a lot of it to deploy <laughs> so thank you bill th and oh, here's no, a thank you. oh my small oh, 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 appreciation well, thank you